Okay, well, welcome everyone and thanks for coming to our uh, presentation today. I'm very excited uh, to have our, our guest speaker today, Liza Nash Taylor. Uh, she is a native Virginian and uh, in her own words, a late blooming author. She lives in Keswick with her husband and her dogs in an old farmhouse, which serves as the setting for her historical novels. Her first, Etiquette for Runaways, came out in August from Blackstone Publishing. It's set in 1924 in Keswick Prohibitionary, I'm sorry, Prohibition Era New York and Jazz Age Paris, and it tells the story of an aspiring costume designer. Parade Magazine listed it in their 30 Best Beach Reads of 2020, and it was the August Book of the Month for 50 plus today. Copies are available wherever you buy books and at the New Dominion Bookshop on the downtown mall. Her second novel, set during the Great Depression, comes out next August. Liza's first career was as a fashion designer for Ralph Lauren in New York. She began writing in her 50s and was a 2018 Hawthorndon International Fellow and received an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts in that same year. Her work has appeared in Gargoyle Magazine, Deep South, and others. To find out more, you can visit her website at LizaNashTaylor.com. Liza, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, I'm delighted to be spending this rainy afternoon here. I don't know if it's raining where you are, but uh, a nice afternoon to just stay inside and and do something. It's so nice to feel the weather finally turning. Um, but thank you to the center for sponsoring this today and also to Writer House and Sibley Johns for also sponsoring. Now, um, as Karen, Carolyn told you, I'm not a fashion historian by trade. I'm a novelist. Um, but my earlier work in fashion has sort of stayed with me in that I love finding out about the history of fashion, especially the day-to-day -day details of what people wore and what their underwear was like, things like that. So I developed this lecture originally last year for the 2019 Historical Novel Society Conference in Washington. And uh, their, in, their whole theme was revolution. So everything having to do with the conference had to do with that theme. So uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to share my screen with you, and I should just be a little icon in your upper right-hand corner. And if, if you have questions, please type them into the chat. I won't have access to the whole chat the whole time. I'll check in and out, but I'll certainly look at your questions at the end if I don't get to them during, uh, during the talk, okay? Um, now, in... 2020, and of course, I'm talking pre-COVID, right, when we all used to wear real clothes. Um, with the help of a leather biker jacket or shredded jeans or boss lady pants, a woman, or anyone for that matter, could channel an identity through our choices in clothing. What we wear can inspire confidence, or it can help us blend into the background. Um, each of the pieces in our wardrobes arguably has a history, from blue jeans to brassieres. But what we wear or choose not to wear really identifies us. And, and we have a lot more choices than we ever used to have. Um, so the, what we wear, I think, in effect, uh, conveys the history of where women have been and what they fought to change. Uh, at the end, there'll be a link to my website, and I developed a list of books that I used in research, as well as a list of historical novels, many of them having to do with some of the designers I'm going to talk about today. So you can go back to that if you want to know more information. Now, um, all right, I'm going to go to screen share now. I, I hope I'm actually able to pull this off uh, without a snafu. Okay, I hope you're all seeing a blue, a red, white, and blue screen, and, um, and I'm just a little stamp up there. Okay, yes. good, good. Uh, now, I chose to begin in 1850 because of one particular garment, but before I tell you more, I have to back up a little bit. 
hold on, my remote is not working. Sorry. Sorry, have little. Are you looking to advance your slides? Yes, sometimes, I have a remote. Right, uh, sometimes but... clicking on the mouse when there's a lot of people on Zoom works better. I don't know if that's an option for you. Yeah. Huh. Well, my. Okay, let me unplug that. Sorry. No worries. Okay. All right. Now we're moving. Um, okay, so where was I? The bicycle. Um, we'll start with an invention. In the 1830s and 40s, bicycles were starting to be mass produced and they were wildly popular. Women saw men tooling around on cycles and they wanted to get in on the fun. Um, you can see in the shot on the left that that girl sitting in the little seat would so much rather be pedaling and steering. Um, women cyclists at this time were lampooned as we see in, in this cartoon on the right. The caption translates from French into, into you hoo everybody, close your peepers. Now at the time, bicycling for ladies, much like women's suffrage, was considered controversial. Moral guardians proclaimed the bicycle is the devil's advocate agent, morally and physically. Now, what women were wearing then was things like this, hoops, corsets, bustles, and voluminous horsehair hemmed skirts and petticoats that were constricting and an impediment to biking, not to mention dangerous. So by enabling women to control their own transportation needs, the bicycle offered an autonomy that had previously been out of reach. Riding a bicycle shattered norms of appropriate conduct for women, and it ushered in a new era of women asserting control over their bodies and their behavior. For reasons of health and freedom of movement, more progressive women began to instigate dress reform. In 1851, Elizabeth Smith Miller of Geneva, New York, debuted a radical new look, a knee-length skirt with full Turkish-style pantaloons gathered at the ankle. The garment I'm speaking of, we now know of as bloomers. Now, bloomers were not invented by Amelia Bloomer, but she popularized them through her trailblazing newspaper for women called The Lily. Amelia wrote articles calling for changes in dress that would be less restrictive and make personal adornment of secondary importance. Bloomers were revolutionary because the idea of women having the same freedom of movement as men was scandalous. The Lily urged women to shed their heavy, bulky hoop skirts in favor of a new healthful style. Bloomers made it easier for the wearers to get through doorways onto carriages and trains unassisted, as well as making it easier for a woman to dress herself. The bloomer costume became a tangible symbol in the advancement of women's rights and infamous amongst the movement's critics. At the first national convention for women's rights in 1850, Women's suffrage was proposed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. One of the speakers was Lucy Stone, an orator and suffragist. Uh, she was also an abolitionist and an early champion of women's rights. Lucy made headlines, not for what she said, but for what she wore. The press was so negative, in fact, that Susan B. Anthony and other suffragists discarded the bloomer style after they realized that they were getting more attention for their dress than for their message. At the turn of the century, suffragists were encouraged both in the US and in Britain to dress traditionally in order to avoid accusations of eccentricity or spinsterish masculinity. It was a sort of a spoonful of sugar mentality. They realized that their best chance of winning the vote was to align themselves, at least outwardly, with Victorian and Edwardian ideals of femininity, even if they were engaging in seditious behavior under the radar. Alignment with the suffrage cause was, for the most part, shown by adorning white dresses with sashes or jewelry in the suffrage colors, which were green, white, 
and violet, standing for give women the vote. In the US, they sometimes use gold instead of green, but this showed unity, and it was a code that was instantly recognizable to fellow sympathizers and a quiet statement to those who didn't back the cause. Here are some suffrage jewelry. Um, on the left, there's a portrait of the English suffragist, Evelyn Pankhurst. The middle is a hunger strike medal, and then there's a brooch in the shape of a jail door. So at the height of the suffrage campaign between 1890 and 1900, the number of bicycle manufacturing firms in America rose from 27 to 312, with a corresponding growth in, in the production of accessories, including clothing. The bloomer style was adapted from fashion bloomers into athletic bloomers or knickerbockers, but women were still being lampooned. This cartoon on the right says, the mob objects to the lady cyclist wearing socks. So even so, there was no keeping women off their bikes. And here's what we probably could call the first sports bra from 1890. Susan B. Anthony once said of the bicycle, I think it's done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It gives women a feeling of freedom and self-reliance. Anthony described the image of a woman on a bicycle as the picture of free, untrammeled womanhood. Now, at the same time the manufacture and design of bicycles was affecting women's fashion, another machine was also being refined and patented. The Singer sewing machine, designed for home use, debuted at a time when the average annual American income was $500. Isaac Singer's sewing machines sold for $125, and they were selling. By the time Singer died in 1875, his company was turning a profit of $22 million a year. Now, the way that we now fear that drones or robots will replace human jobs, tailors and garment workers in the 19th century worried about the sewing machine. In France, one early inventor of a sewing machine opened one of the first garment factories in the 1830s. And it was burned to the ground with him inside by a mob of 200 ticked off tailors. The guy survived though. Now, the sewing machine made production more exact, faster, and cheaper, and in the 1880s, it was electrified. And so, leading up to the turn of the century, we start to see a whole lot more ruffles and gathers in women's dresses. And at the same time, another invention, this one an accident, had a huge and lasting effect on women's fashion, and that was aniline or synthetic dyes. An 18-year-old aspiring chemist from England named William Henry Perkin was working on a cure for malaria in his lab when he noticed that the chemical sludge left from his experiments turned his fingers a brilliant purple. William switched direction and went into the chemical dye business. Heretofore, dyes could only be produced from natural sources and they were expensive. Now, through chemicals, what we think of as garishly vivid Victorian colors were first available. Perkins's Movine was the very first of these. Now, another seemingly insignificant invention had a large effect on women's fashion, and this has to do with the corset. 18th century corsets, as you see on the left, used steel and bone stiffeners called busks to produce this sort of cone-like shape. But moving into the 19th century, the Ampere look was popular. When we think about um, Jane Aust the era of Jane Austen, all those uh, dresses where the waistline was right under the bust. Um, then moving into the mid 19th century, the hourglass silhouette as defined by corsets had become popular. The look was achieved through the innovation of eyelets, 
those tiny small metal rings that run vertically down the lacings of a corset. Now we have them on our sneakers, right? With eyelets, the corset could be pulled tighter than ever before, as we see in this cartoon of the period. The term straight laced meant that the laces of a woman's corset were pulled so tight that they came together in a straight line and forced the back up and made it a little hard to breathe. Conversely, to be called a loose woman meant that your corset wasn't tied that tightly, allowing for easier removal and breathing, heavy or otherwise. Now, during this time, of course, the sale of smelling salts did very well. So moving into, in, in, the, night, in the 1850s, sorry, wasp waists and, and an exaggeratedly feminine silhouette were the look. And through the rest of the 19th century, corsets remained popular with variations in bustles, hoops, trimmings, and sleeves, but the silhouette was the same. Now, by the turn of the century, the corseted look was exemplified by the ideal woman, as illustrated by the very popular illustrator of the day, Charles Dana Gibson. The Gibson girl, uh, the living representation of Dana's Gibson girl was the actress Camille Clifford, whom you see in the photographs. Um, the look, it was almost an S-shaped silhouette from the side. Um, really very, very artificial. And of, um, the look was also promoted through the growing popularity of photography at this time. And as you can see, there was some early Photoshopping going on here in the late 1800s. Uh, so despite the restrictions of corsets, women, especially in the middle class, began to have more social freedoms. Women friends could travel together abroad, albeit with chaperones. Um, if you all remember the beautiful E.M. Forster story from 1908, A Room with a View, it was a made into a movie in 1986. Um, and it tells a story of women traveling together. But women at this time began to wear more separates, blouses and skirts and little jackets. And we began to see something of a menswear inspired look with women wearing tailored shirts and little neckties, but still the corset underneath of it all. So now I'm going to switch over uh, and we've been talking about innovations and so forth. I'm going to now tell you about some specific designers. And there's a reason why I'm not going to talk about any designers before 1850 because before the 1860s and the use of sewing machines, men went to tailors and women went to dressmakers. Uh, there were no fashion shows. There were no seasonal collections. And nowadays, when, when we think of fashion designers, dozens of names come to mind, right? But in the 1860s, there was only one rock star in the fashion world. Charles Frederick Worth was born in London in 1825. And he taught about himself about fashion and garment construction by studying 18th century portraits of royals in museums. After working as an apprentice to textile merchants, he had a break selling some early designs to an English noblewoman. And at the age of 20, he took off for Paris. He worked for a French designer and some of his dresses won acclaim. Worth's designs caught the eye of European royalty. And in 1860, Empress Eugénie, the wife of Napoleon III, appointed Worth her court couturier. She's pictured here in this amazing Worth gown, along with Empress Elizabeth, the wife of Franz Joseph of Austria, also in Worth. Now, in 1883, Alva Vanderbilt threw a costume ball in New York that was estimated to cost $250,000. That's nearly $6 million today. Worth made Alva's costume, which he called the spirit of electricity. 
And if any of you all have read um, Therese Ann Fowler's novel, um, it's called A Well-Behaved Woman, A Story of the Vanderbilts, you'll know about this party and this dress. It was really quite something. Worth was the first designer to use live models and to show seasonal collections to clients from his showroom. He was also the first to sew a branded label into his clothes. So with women coming for showings and fittings at his Paris Atelier, the salon became a society meeting point. Instead of having women come to him and say, uh, I want to dress like Mrs. Smith down the road, he said no. He designed his collection and he said, here is what is fashionable this season. Take it or leave it. Uh, he pioneered the concept of mixing and matching skirts and bodices so a woman could have a dressier top for the same, uh, out of the same fabric. Um, he developed interchangeable pattern pieces, which together with the electric sewing machine, revolutionized production methods. And Worth is considered by many fashion historians to be the father of haute couture, which translates literally into high sewing. So he came from England, you know, with, without having much, and he really did make it on his fashion dictator in the mid and late Victorian era and moving into the Belle Epoque. In this last slide, you can see how between 1916 and 1926, over a 10 year span within this one fashion house, the silhouettes evolved from Edwardian to what we think of as the flapper style. It wasn't as, as drastic as sometimes we think it was. Um, so by the end of Charles Worth's career, his house employed 1,200 people. His sons would continue the business, increasing the impact on the House of Worth on women's fashion. Now, uh, I'm going to just, okay, I can't really stop and see if there are any questions um, without getting out of the screen. I don't see anything in the chat at this time. Okay, okay, Thank great. Thank you. All right. So, jumping back for a minute to our starting point. After Japan opened up to Western trade in 1850, there was a steadily increasing amount of Eastern influence in all areas of Western art and design. Later, in a similar way, Africa would have a big influence on the 1920s. But in the 19-teens, this Asian influence can be seen most notably in the work of Paul Poiret. He's another Parisian designer, a native Frenchman. Poiret began his career working for other designers, including the son of Charles Frederick Worth, but their opposing design aesthetics led Poiret to open his own house in 1903. The first thing he did was to eliminate the petticoat and the bustle. The second was to eliminate the corset in 1906, and this was huge. Poiret affected a revolution in women's dressmaking. Now, because he didn't know how to sew, his designs shifted the emphasis away from the skills of tailoring and pattern making to those based on draping, which is hanging fabric sculpturally off of the natural form instead of using patterns to construct a covering for the artificial frame of the corset and bustle. So in the 1910s and teens leading up to World War I, Poiret's star rose until he declared himself the king of fashion. He was one of the first designers to really challenge the silhouettes of, Victorian and, of the Victorian and Edwardian eras and to work in collaboration with artists, most notably Raoul Dufy. And here is a coat that they came up with together in 1911. Poiret was also the first designer to advertise using photography. And keeping up with 
his ex-employer, the House of Worth, Poiret jumped on the bandwagon of the celebrity designer. You can see here in 1911, their silhouettes are, are almost identical, really. Um, but Poiret threw lavish costume balls for his customers at his house with costumes like this one, which show his wonderfully imaginative design aesthetic. Now, Poiret left his business in Paris in, uh, to serve in World War I as an army tailor. And when he returned, he found that post-war fashion wasn't as fantastical and elaborate, and, and he couldn't adapt. So over the next 15 years, his groundbreaking designs would be entirely forgotten. His wife would divorce him, and, and his couture house would close with all of the leftover stock being sold by the pound as rags. The Association of Haute Couture discussed giving him a monthly allowance, but the idea was vetoed by, guess who, his former employer, the House of Worth. Now there is a good plot for a novel, I think. Um, okay, backing up a bit, another innovation this another one by a woman so let's go back to 1914 um and where am i here okay um in 1914 the course it had been eliminated but there really nobody really come up with anything else for women to wear under their clothes so uh in 1913 a 19-year-old debutante named Mary Phelps Jacobs was dressing for a ball. She thought her corset just ruined the line of her sleek evening gown. And uh, she took two handkerchiefs and some ribbon, and she and her maid whipped this up. Um, the next year, she got a patent for her design for the first brassiere. Mary would later live in Paris where her husband would change her name. Caress, as she was now called, and Harry Crosby would become the most notoriously decadent couple in Jazz Age Paris with a wild life of swinging, sex, drugs, and parties, but that's for another lecture. Uh, Caress was also an author and a publisher in her own right. Now, the main competition for the House of Worth and Paul Poiret, both houses led by men, came from a British woman. In order to support herself and her daughter at the end of her first marriage, Lucy Duff Gordon began working as a dressmaker from home. In 1893, she opened Maison Lucille in London. And over the next 20 years, Lucille would become the first premier couture house with international branches in Paris, London, New York, and Chicago. Lucy was one of the first to offer seasonal shows, and there's an invitation to one of her shows. Uh, she called them mannequin parades, and they were a well-orchestrated social who-so. Lucy remarried to a Scottish nobleman, but she stayed in business. And her dresses, as you can see, were supremely feminine. Lucy believed that if dresses were to give any pleasure to their wearer, they must become a part of their personality. So she named each of her designs using inspiration from literature and popular culture. She called her collections her emotional gowns. And in the middle is a tea gown that's named the happiness dress. And it has all the bells and whistles, netting, lace, gathers, layers, ruffles, ribbon, tucks, pleats, ruching. I mean, everything. It looks, to me, it looks like, uh, it reminds me of the, of the Disney movie uh, Cinderella, like there should be little cartoon bluebirds flying around and tying bows all around that dress. Um, but anyway, her, her uh, workmanship was really very beautiful. 
the Lucille look, it was quite recognizable. It was rendered in chiffon and lace and silks in delicate color combinations with really exquisite details. Um, she was the first designer to woo the press to see her collections, and she wrote monthly columns for Harper's Bazaar and Good Housekeeping. Nobody was doing that yet, really. No socialites or anything. So in the 1910s, Lucy Duff Gordon was all that. She dressed Irene Castle and Mary Pickford and Isadora Duncan and her own equally glamorous sister, Eleanor Glynn, who was an actress and a romantic novelist of some notoriety. However, Lucy's career was fraught with controversy. In 1912, when the Titanic sank, Lucy and her family were on board. There was a lawsuit questioning how the Duff Gordons, the Lord included, managed to be on the last um, lifeboat to leave the ship with only 12 people when it held 40. So after the tight, they were cleared actually, after the Titanic controversy, uh, even though she was cleared, Lucy's reputation declined further when another lawsuit accused her of taking credit for the designs of her assistants. Now fans of Downton Abbey might remember that in the script, Lucille was a designer of Lady Edith's first wedding dress in season three. And the costume designer for the series, Caroline McCall, found an original Lucille wedding train and then designed the dress to go with it. Okay, so we're still post World War I and another rising player on the scene in Paris and moving forward is a name we all know. No other designer has such lasting impact on fashion as Coco Chanel. While Poiret helped her get established, Chanel seemed to have no problem leaving him in the dirt when he left for the war. Over her long career, uh, Chanel defined the notion of staples that would last a lifetime. The little black dress, the tweed jacket, the feminine suit. But it was a type of fabric that would first put Chanel on the map. While sewing machine technology was progressing, so was textile manufacturing technology. And Chanel was the first to use wool jersey for something other than underwear or swimwear. Her concept, which was quite revolutionary, was that fashion should be available to all, that dresses should have multiple uses, and sportswear could be stylish as well as utilitarian. And Chanel's boxy, shorter, and easy to move in pieces further freed women from corsets and Poiret inspired hobbled skirts of the 19-teens. In 1926, Vogue magazine first introduced what we now think of as the little black dress. I would wear that dress in a heartbeat. I think it's fabulous. They christened it the Ford dress after the Model T because it was affordable. It suited every figure and it could take the wearer anywhere she wanted to go. It was made of pleated wool jersey. Now before this, black was the color of mourning. Chanel made it chic. She also, at the same time, pioneered the garçon style, borrowing design elements and silhouettes from menswear and tailoring details from riding habits and service uniforms in her quest to reduce and refine women's clothing to its simplest and most elegant form. In the truest sense of the word, Chanel was a modernist. But to me, what made Chanel's work evolutionary was not just her impeccable eye and her clever innovation, it was her constant ability to reinvent herself. Her shop in Paris closed during World War II, uh, and after the war, there was a lot of controversy. She was accused of collaborating with the Nazis, and there's some evidence that she did. But she'd managed to come back in a big way 
with the heyday of her popularity peaking in the 1960s with her iconic ladylike suits. And when, that, when we think of Chanel now, that's kind of the image that we get in our mind. But today, even without Madame Coco herself, the line is still a major trendsetter. Here is uh, a new novel on the left about Chanel during World War II and her uh, collaboration, alleged collaboration with the Nazis, and another novel by, that just came out in paperback by Jean Mackin. It's uh, based around the rivalry between Coco Chanel and the, the Italian designer working in France, Elsa Scaparelli, who I'll talk to you about in just a minute. Now, at the same time that Chanel and Poiret were building their empires, there was another rising star in Paris in the form of Jean Lavin. Lavin began as a milliner in 1889 and later, inspired by her daughter Marguerite, she began to design lavish dresses for little girls. This is Lavin with her daughter uh, at a fancy dress ball. And uh, the photo would later be transformed into the Lavin logo. And then on the right, you see a bottle of Arpege. I don't know if any of you all remember Arpege. I think they might still make it, but that's where that logo came from. Um, it was Lavin's children's wear that would really get her noticed. Um, she made these fabulous matching mother-daughter ensembles and they just flew off the shelves. Aren't they amazing? I can't imagine putting a little girl in that. So after the end of World War I, the fashion world was in an upheaval. There was a sort of revival of romantic pre-war fashion in evening dress, but there was no going back to the corset. Lava developed something, a, a, a silhouette that was called a robe de style. And it came to define the era. Uh, it didn't require a corset, but if you see in that middle photo, I know it looks a little strange, uh, they were panniers, which were like sort of two half hoops underneath on a kind of a frame that went around your waist, but they gave this very pretty feminine um, silhouette to these, to these dresses. Um, the style was suited to the, for, to, to the nostalgia for the past felt by a war-weary population, yet the relative simplicity of the design was refreshing. refreshing. Uh, Lamba's designs appealed to and flattered women of all ages, and this robe de style features her trademark use of intricate embroideries and trimmings. It's just amazing. Uh, oh, and here's Lady Rose from Downton Abbey, also wearing a robe de style. Color was really important to Jeanne Lavin, and she maintained her own dye works. This is her apartment, and almost the whole thing is this incredible shade of blue. Uh, it, it's from 1925, and entire rooms of it are on display in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, which is part of the Louvre in Paris, and you can go see it today just as it was when she lived there. She had a brilliant depart department store marketing strategy. It was way ahead of her time. Um, in the 1920s, she expanded her house into bridal wear, furs, lingerie, menswear, sportswear, household goods, and perfume. I mean, like when we think of Ralph Lauren today, doing all those things, it's not a big deal. But back then, it really was. She created a fashion house with the potential for longevity. And today, it's the oldest established couture house still in operation. Now, we're going to move on to the 1930s. And I'm going to tell you about another Parisian designer, Madeleine Viennet. Viennet was not as universally well known as Coco Chanel, but in her time, she was just as influential. 
Madeline insisted she was not a designer. She called herself an architect among dressmakers, a technician. She used lightweight fabrics to create fluid, flattering dresses that integrated comfort and movement and looked fabulous on the female form. Viennet is best known for her innovative use of the bias cut, the technique of cutting on the diagonal grain on the fabric. Previously, I mean, we think about this now, it's not a big deal, but before it had only been used to shape collars and ruffles, and Viennet was the first to use it for garments to create a sinuous and clingy silhouette that we so identify with the glamour of the 1930s. She had fabric custom woven at more than twice the normal width, and she used weighted silk satins where these satins and silks were soaked in, in a metallic solution to make them heavier so that they would drape more luxuriously and move with, with a beautiful movement. Uh, in today's world, though, you know, with all of our stretch and synthetic fabrics, it's easy to overlook how revolutionary it must have been to wear something that draped the body the way Viennese dresses did, especially after the boxy and loose fashions of the 1920s. Viennese style was widely adapted by the fashion world in the 1930s, and it continues to define that decade. Um, I mean, we did have the, uh, of course, we had the Great Depression going on in America, but she was the one dressing all the, the movie stars at that time. Her fashions have a timeless elegance, and they're intricately detailed to the point where if you look at this sketch uh, and the details of it, Sometimes her clients needed help getting into the clothes because they were so, the, the design was so original, they couldn't even figure out how to put them on. Uh, she uh, was a perfectionist. VNA draped her samples on miniature dolls half the size of a human. And she conceived her ideas in three dimensions instead of sketching them or just making them with a flat pattern. Her aim was to make comfortable clothes that fell freely from the body using the shoulders and the waistline as anchoring points, as you can see in this exquisite dress. Um, the bodice is suspended by embroidered crossover straps and the skirt falls from the gathered waist. The straps are jeweled with aquamarine and glass stones set into metal mounts. I wish you could see more of them. Um, but that was another innovation of hers, combining jewelry and fabric into one garment. Now, as I said, v was synonymous with 1930s film star glamour, um, as we see in this dress worn by Jean Harlow. This glamorous, sleek look uh, for American film audiences in the throes of the Depression um, was such an escape from mending and making do. Um, she dressed Greta Garbo, Catherine Hepburn, Joan Crawford, and Marlene Dietrich as well. Now, v influence, I think, is ongoing. Um, and you can see, as compared to this 1990s gown by Azadine Alaya, and one thing uh, that v invented was the cowl neck, by the way. Um, you can see how much influence she still has today. VNA invented the bodycon, what we now call body conscious dress, way before Aliyah even thought of it, maybe before he was born. Uh, so at the top of her empire, VNA employed over a thousand staff in 26 ateliers. Uh, now they might be, you know, one doing embroidery, one doing cutting, whatever. Uh, and in 1932, she acquired a new five-story building in Paris. But what really impressed me about Viennet was that her, her, uh, her five-story building, where everyone worked, provided a clinic equipped with doctors and dentists and a gymnasium for her employees, as well as policies for maternity leave, paid holidays, and daycare really revolutionary. 
Sadly, Madame Vianney had to close her house or couture house at the start of World War II and it never opened. Um, she lived to be 99 years old and she died in 1975. Now, another contemporary of Chanel's, I mentioned her earlier, was the Italian designer Elsa Schiaparelli. In the late 30s, Elsa designed clothes in collaboration with the surrealist artists, most notably Salvador Dali, and that is Dali and Schiaparelli photographed together. In the heyday of surrealism, shock value and expressionism were key. And like Poirette before her, Schiaparelli viewed clothing as a means of artistic expression. She used a lot of trompe l'oeil effects. Uh, this um, sweater, I think, was her real, really her first big, uh, big design hit, putting her on the map. Uh, and then you can see here, this is a collaboration she did with, who was it? Jean Cocteau. Uh, she used a lot of trompe l'oeil effects. Um, and then just so artistic and so cleverly executed. Um, and here are a more of uh, here are a few more of her most notable designs. Culottes. We don't think about culottes. Culottes are culottes, but somebody invented them. Uh, it was Elsa Schiaparelli. She designed them for a Wimbledon competitor in 1931. And next from her 1937 collaboration with Salvador Dali, uh, you see the lobster dress worn by the Duchess of Windsor. And in the middle there is Salvador Dali's lobster phone. So he could be like, hey, Wallace, finished your dress. I'll bring it over in just a minute. Uh, it was quite a remarkable dress, actually kind of shocking at the time. And here's another one the tear dress from 1937, which shows not only Scaparelli's great eye for trompe l'oeil with those savage looking rips printed into the fabric, but it also has a sense of impending violence that reflects the pre-World War feeling in Europe at this time. Now here is my personal favorite. It reminds me of some of Alexander McQueen's designs, it, the sculptural skeleton dress from 1938. On the right, you can see the Dolly sketch that inspired it, and only this one prototype was ever made. Okay, I'm going to pause and insert an innovation. If you will, stop for a minute and, okay, first, Imagine that we're sitting at the center and we're, it's not uh, 2020 and we're all wearing real clothes and we might have a purse or a tote bag or something with us. Um, think for a minute, if those were the circumstances, how many zippers would you have on your clothing and the things you would be carrying with you? Three, four, more? Um, well, a hundred years ago, probably none of us would have had a single zipper. Elias Howe, remember him? Bonus points, he invented the sewing machine. He also invented a rudimentary zipper in 1851. But it would take 50 more years and several redesigns before the zipper could be manufactured reliably and affordably. The zipper first gained popularity in World War I for closing soldiers' galoshes and tobacco pouches. And then after the war, it was used in children's clothes in the way that we use Velcro today on kids' sneakers to help them dress themselves more easily and simply. In 1937, zippers began to replace buttons on men's trouser flies. And that same year, Elsa Schiaparelli started using zippers in her couture gowns. This was, I mean, Schiaparelli was a little risque, uh, a little um, outre, um, but this dress and other dresses that she designed with zippers were pretty scandalous, you know, easy in, easy out. Um, 
Now, while many of Scaparelli's clothes were radical and artistic, she was also a great champion of women exhibiting a personal style. In 1934, she made the cover of Time magazine. She was the first female fashion designer to ever earn that honor. She invented the color shocking pink, and she designed the bottle for her perfume, also called shocking, after a dress form that was modeled from Mae West's torso. Now, a similar concept uh, would be used later in the 1980s by Jean-Paul Gaultier, and also more recently and more literally by that great fashion innovator, Kim Kardashian. Yeah, so in, now we're up to World War II. In the early 1940s, of course, the World War happened and women made a great positive impact on the war effort with rationing and with, with going in and working for the war effort. So clothing during that time, I mean, there was rationing, of course, it was really about functionality and, and, and making do with what you have and, and all of the designs used as little yardage as possible. But this would all change. So we're gonna move right along to post-World War II Paris. Suddenly, cloth rationing was no more. Workers returned to the fashion ateliers of Paris, and in 1947, Christian Dior's new, his new look heralded the return of women to the hearth when their men came home from war. Now, just as Lava had done after World War I, Dior seemed to intuit this new, very feminine silhouette, which used lavish yardage in its wide, flattering skirts. And he could tell it was just what the public wanted. This was excess, pretty for pretty's sake, and it defined a new, hopeful, lighthearted style. On the left, you see the iconic bar ensemble, which sort of, uh, identifies this whole concept uh, with the, the full skirt. There's a lot going on underneath there with crinolines and, and petticoats. Um, if you watched Outlander, you might remember how cleverly the costume designer interpreted this silhouette. It was brilliant, I thought, the way she brought Claire's 1940 sensibility into play in an 18th century setting. Just beautifully done. So Dior's new look was a smash. And by the next year, American women wanted the same thing. This is a photo of my mom modeling in 1948. Dior even got women back into corsets and the development, but they weren't the same corsets made of bone and wire and stuff. Um, the development of nylon and elastics and fasteners and, and new production machinery led to innovations in foundation garments. Uh, one style did not last long, thank God. What we now call the bullet bra warrants really no further discussion, although I would love to give a lecture just about underwear. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. We're gonna keep going into the 1950s. If you have in your closet denim shirts, wrap dresses, cotton sundresses, and ballet flats, you should probably thank Claire McArdle. As the mother of American style and ready-to-wear fashions, McArdle defined an era when the U.S. was wrestling to find its own fashion identity. According to Smithsonian Magazine, McArdle's collections through the Great Depression and World War II reflected not only the needs of the time, but the changing social position of women who were moving from the home 
into the workplace and into male-dominated colleges. McArdle offered women clothes that mirrored their new attitudes, defining a new vision of practical, energetic, energetic femininity. I mean, these clothes were fun. Dior's new look wasn't for everyone. Not everyone could afford it, for one thing. And that's where McArdle stepped in. She gave women the option to reject expensive high maintenance, French fashion and all the trimmings that went with it. More impressive still, her pieces were affordable for everyone. Her popover dress sold in the thousands for $6.95. At a time when designer dresses by um, popular designers Norell and Ka Hattie Carnegie ran into the hundreds of dollars. Now, we don't hear much about Claire McArdle anymore, but we should. Her simple silhouettes and frugal use of fabrics, particularly during, during World War II, helped shape the democratic and casual sensibility that we associate with re American ready-to-wear today. Her influence was so great that in 1950, President Truman presented her with the Women's National Press Club Award, and she went on to win many design awards, and her, her styles are still being interpreted today. McArdle worked from the principle that style and comfort were not mutually exclusive. She used wash and wear fabrics. She designed clothes that worked on every body shape. The same dress used had pleats and wraps and ties and sashes that could individualize a garment's fit to the wearer's specific proportions. She was the first one to come up with mix and match separates, spaghetti straps, pedal pushers, bareback summer dresses. And many of her innovations have been with, with us for so long that it's hard to tell which is current and which is 70 years old. Another American designer, and one whom history doesn't much remember, is Anne Lowe. Anne Lowe was the first African American to have her own fashion label, and she made a name for herself by creating one-of-a-kind gowns for high society debutantes, matrons, and brides with names like Rockefeller and Vanderbilt. Her workmanship was exquisite, and despite segregation and racism, Lowe was very particular about who she, was, who she would work for. She was born in 1889 in Alabama, and her, she grew up with a passion for fine sewing and design. Her mother was a seamstress, uh, and Lowe taught herself in her mother's workroom to sew with using scraps these exquisite fabric flowers that became one of her signature design elements. When she was 16, Anne Lowe's mother died suddenly, and Lowe took over her business. Uh, she then went to New York and attended design school. The school was segregated, and she was required to, uh, to audit classes from another room. And yet her, her exquisite work was often used as an example for her fellow students. She uh, ended up opening a salon in New York, and in 1953, she got what ha should have been her big break when she designed Jacqueline Bouvier's wedding dress for her marriage to John F. Kennedy. This voluminous off-the-shoulder gown was constructed from 50 yards of ivory silk taffeta, 50 yards, and it took eight weeks to complete. Ten days before the wedding ceremony, a water line broke in Lowe's studio and it ruined the wedding gown and all 10 of the bridesmaids' dresses. Working night and day, Lowe and her staff recreated the dresses in five days. She never told the family and she lost money on the order. Sadly, Lowe didn't get the credit she deserved. She was only mentioned in the Washington Post where the fashion editor simply wrote, the dress was designed by a Negro, Anne Lowe. Financial setbacks and health issues plagued her later career and Lowe became partially blind, but she's pictured here in her signature stylish hat. 
and her amazing work lives on in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Smithsonian. Now, we're up to the 1960s, okay? Two more designers to go. Mary Quant was a British designer, born in 1930 when Madeleine Vianney was at her peak. Quant was a major player in the mod fashion movement and she's widely credited as the inventor of the miniskirt and hot pants, which might ne never have happened except for the introduction of nylon pantyhose in 1959. Now, shorter skirts had been shown in Paris in the early 60s, but it was Quant uh, who was then running a trendy boutique in London who saw young women taking this look to the streets and turning a couture trend into streetwear. Quant used modern innovations in synthetic knit fabrics brilliantly, and her playful mini and hot pants and colored tights and space age vinyl go-go boots were youthful and fun. And just like with bloomers a hundred years earlier, they became a tangible symbol of growing liberation and revolution in women's fashion. Quant's looks were accessible and affordable to young working women. They were sold in sears with patterns made by Butterick for home sewing. But just like with bloomers, not everyone was on board. The mini skirt was a rebellion. In 2009, a British postage stamp was issued commemorating Mary Quant's work, and she was named an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 2015. In 2019, a retrospective of her work opened at the V&A in London. Okay, we're up to the 1960s, and I hope you can stay awake for one more designer. Um, I don't know if any of you all enjoy going to the VMFA in Richmond, but a couple of years ago, they had a fabulous exhibition on Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, at the age of 18, Yves Saint Laurent arrived in Paris after finishing college. A year later, in 1955, he was hired by Christian Dior. Now, Dior died from a heart attack uh, in, uh, I think in 1957, um, but Saint Laurent became the head of Dior at the age of 21. He was the youngest head of a couture house ever. In 1960, he was drafted by his home country of Algeria, and while he was gone, he was fired and replaced. So when he got back, he and his partner, Pierre Berge, opened YSL. Now, uh, Saint Laurent's designs for Dior continued Dior's philosophy. They were feminine and flattering and very beautiful. But Eve found his true voice in his solo collections and this is where he changed fashion. In 1966, his collection featured a pop art line with trompe l'oeil effects reminiscent of Scaparelli, right? But what really turned heads that year and had a lasting impact were his pants suits. In that year, he introduced the woman's tuxedo, which had the sensibility of a man's dinner suit, but cut to flatter the female form. A year after the tuxedo, he introduced his first pants suit, and we've been wearing them ever since. I have a godmother who's almost 90, and she remembers being in Paris at this time, and, and first seeing pants suits in the windows of shops. And at that, she told me at that point, uh, in New York City, a woman couldn't go into a nice restaurant wearing pants. So this really was a, a big, big deal. Um, here is Saint Laurent in 1970 uh, with two of his muses. And you can see that in that, that sketch how really changed his designs were. Um, the taller of the two women, Betty Catru, he considered his female alter ego. Um, and you can see here, this is that safari collection that you just saw in a sketch. Um, and it, see what a far cry it is from those very ladylike dresses he was doing for Dior just 10 years previously. So the next time 
you zip up your stretch jeans or you put on a short skirt with tights. Uh, I hope you'll think about how each of these innovations and designers I've talked about today have changed fashion. Not just with a raised or lowered hemline, they changed the way women dressed. And I'm going to end as I began with a protest. This one from 1966 from London from the British Society for the Protection of the Miniskirt. I would love it if you'd follow me on social media. Um, my, I have an author page on Facebook, Liza Nash Taylor on Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest. I'm Liza Nash Taylor, all one word. Um, and yeah, I'd love to tell you uh, about my book sometime. I'd love it if you'd contact me and let me come talk to your book club sometime. Um, Okay, I'm back. Um, so, yeah, as I said, there is a reading list on my website that goes along with this talk. Please contact me through my website if you have any questions about anything we've talked about, if you want to know more. Um, here is my book, my beautiful novel, came out in August. As uh, Carolyn said, you can get it at New Dominion Bookshop. Uh, you can get it at Barnes & Noble and at the Laurie Holiday Shop in Gordonsville, all signed copies, or you can order it wherever you normally order books for, from, or listen to the audiobook. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Wow, that was such a <laughs> delightful and fascinating romp through the ages of fashion, things I never thought about. Um, Thank you all for being here. And I see, Virginia, you've unmuted yourself. Do you yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that I really, really enjoyed your talk a lot. I thought it was fascinating. And it kind of makes me nostalgic for like a more elegant time. I've been reading about some books about the Gilded Age. And then I've been watching a TV series, A Place to Call Home. Do you, are you familiar with that? In the no, 1950s. Not. No. It takes place in Australia in the 1950s. And just the fashion back then was just so cool. So um, I just thought your talk was great. And can you tell me a little bit about what your book is about? Sure, yes. Um, it's set in 1924. It's historical fiction. And um, it's actually set at the house where I'm sitting right now in Keswick, Virginia. And it moves on to New York and then on to Paris. And my main character, Mae Marshall, is an aspiring costume designer. She, um, she's attended Mary Baldwin College and managed to get herself kicked out through misbehavior with the young man. And she comes back home to Keswick Farm to find that her father has turned the family orchard business into a lucrative moonshining operation. And he gets busted, she goes on the run, and she meets up with, uh, she makes friends in New York, and she ends up going to Paris with a troupe of African American dancers and entertainers that are inspired by Josephine Baker and her debut in 1925 in Paris in La Revue Neg. So um, I set the book in places I'd lived in New York, my first grotty apartment and the first uh, rooming house I lived in. And then in Paris, um, I, I was able to have a tour of the Theater de Champs Elysees and the Musée Nissim de Commando, which is a mansion house museum. And I use it as a setting and imagine it's still a private res residence. Um, so yeah, so, and there's a love story running through there as well. But it's really about um, how we tell lies and, and when things aren't going well, we maybe tell people, oh, everything's great, I'm doing really well, Job, new job's great, when in fact things aren't going well at all. And that's what May does and it kind of snowballs and she really ends up hitting rock bottom and her friends bring her back. Um, so that's that's all I'm going to tell you about it right now. But I, I do, I would love to talk to book clubs or come back and great. have a book chat with you all. Yeah, no, it sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. I see someone is saying, can I talk about Edith Head? Um, I can't right now. We're kind of, I mean, we're running kind of out of time, but she is 
fascinating. She designed some of the most iconic costumes for movies through the years. Um, and what a, what a great designer she was. I wish I knew more about her, frankly. I mean, I had to research the people I talked about today. I didn't just like, this just doesn't come off the cuff. I, I had to do some work for it. Um, let's see, any other questions? I love um, this comment and I think it's really true. Thank you so much. Do not be offended because of no questions. No one <laughs> wants to miss a word. Mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, I think, very true. Although, uh, Dorothy, you've unmuted yourself. And folks, just so you know, um, if you're willing oh, to I, stay, Liza, I, that's I great. Think the topic it, is very timely in these days when women are, are not worrying about what they're going to wear. They're worrying about, do I get to go out and wear something? feminine and it, it was very timely to know that there are still clothes and, and where they all came from very good timing <laughs> yeah thank you thank mm -hmm. you yeah, and if anyone needs to go that's fine but Liza if you're willing to stay for a few more minutes we can sure, field some yes. questions so absolutely all right I thought it was fascinating about the bicycle I mean I just you know in different inventions and how they would revolutionize what we wore and how we thought about ourselves. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's true. I mean, so much of, you know, when we get up and get dressed now and uh, we don't think about uh, who came up with Lycra, you know, uh, in our yoga pants and um, who invented Velcro, all, all of these things, you know, they, they do all have a history. And once I started doing the research for this talk, I, uh, 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 there were so many rabbit holes and I ended up really having to try to narrow it down according to evolutionary and revolutionary, but there was still so much more I could have gotten into. As I said, I would love to do a lecture just about underwear through the ages. <laughs> I think that would be well attended. Sibley, you want to say something? Yeah. Hi, Liza. And Hi, Hi Sibley. Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And um, I'm Sibley Johns from Writer House. And we're just really thrilled to have been able to partner with the center and with you, Carolyn, to do this. And Liza, that was amazing and really fun. And, you know, I was thinking throughout it all how, um, you know, how interesting it is that, you know, all of this hullabaloo around what women wear was is so reflective of this, um, you know, the the ambivalence that our culture has about women and the role they play because i'd be amazed or fascinated to see the contrast of men's the evolution of men's fashion because it seems like so much more you know subdued and and it feels like light you know women are just a, a lightning rod for you know sort of the, these experiments and you know just the role that women play versus men i'm just curious if you have any wisdom or insight on that? Well, that's, that's a really good point, Sibley. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, aside from, uh, you know, like the 18th century when men were wearing little stockings and knickers and high heels in France and stuff like that, um, men's wear really hasn't changed very much. It's comfortable. It's utilitarian for the most part. Uh, it is women's fashion. You know, women have always been the you know the butterflies of of changing with the whims of designers and and as i showed you you know once a corset could technically be laced tighter everybody was getting laced up tighter um so yeah it is it, it's it's amazing now and it's amazing to see even since um 1970 when i stopped talking about you know progression of fashion what's happened since 1970 uh, with what we wear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think it's interesting that it's, uh, you know, that women, it seems incumbent upon women to have to embellish themselves so much more than men to be seen, to be recognized, to be desirable. And I just think it's an interesting commentary on the structure of our society. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Oh, I have a quick question. Can you? Yes. Me? Uh, yes, I can. Can you tell us about a little bit more about yourself? And, and I remember uh, back in the eighties, there was the Lisa Taylor Fellowship to Paris, 
that I, I won through the Smithsonian. And I didn't know if that was something that you were involved with or it's just coincidental. But I think you should let us know, how did you get to this point in your life where you were, I mean, we're all fascinated by fashion, but, but how, did you, how did you become you? Oh, well, um, I'm not affiliated with that fellowship, by the way. Um, it sounds amazing, really. Um, I started out, I grew up in Virginia Beach. And when I was six, I learned to knit and to embroider. And I was kind of that nerdy girl. I, I read a lot. I didn't like the heat. I didn't go outside that much. Uh, I wasn't athletic. Uh, I made patchwork quilts for fun. And I read voraciously. And I loved... Um, some of my favorite books were A Little Princess and The Secret Garden by Francis, Francis Hodgson Burnett. And that, I kind of developed this, this urge, this yearning to be an abandoned English orphan. And then as I got a little older, um, I think that led me into a love of English literature. And I started liking, um, you know, Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. And so I always had an interest in reading and that sort of went along with an interest in fashion history. Um, I, I graduated from Mary Baldwin with a degree in art in 1981. And then I went to New York, I moved to New York and I lived in, in a rooming house that I use as, as a location in my novel, as I said. Um, and I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology. They had a graduate program wow. at that time. And I went to Parsons School of Design. But before I finished the, the program at FIT, I was hired by Ralph Lauren. And that was, that was a dream come true when I was 22. And I worked there for several years. Um, it was very demanding, uh, didn't pay very well. And um, I got married and ended up leaving New York and going to live in Nant on Nantucket Island for seven years, where I, I had a shop selling antiques and antique linens and tableware and just taking sort of a, a different but creative um, direction. Um, I divorced and remarried and moved back to Virginia about 26 years ago. And now I live in Keswick. So um, I was raising kids along the way. I had a line of baby accessories that I made out of recycled cashmere sweaters for Barney's in New York. They're gone now, but um, I did f uh, photo styling during in that interim uh, for some of the catalogs in the area, and I designed products for the Monticello catalog and museum store, and did display there and things like that. And um, and then when my youngest went to high school, I decided I wanted to go back to school and study literature. So at the age of 53, I marched over to uh, Piedmont Community College and I was going to sign up for English. And, and the nice young advisor in the office there said, um, well, Mrs. Taylor, do you want to take this class for credit or would you just like to audit? And that just really ticked me off. So right then I decided I was going to get a degree in English and took all the classes I could there, then moved to online learning because that was when that was just sort of exploding. And from there I went on, I, I, I took a writing class, the first writing class, um, through Mary Baldwin online. And I was so hooked, I did a complete turnaround. And the next year I started applying for MFA programs. And so I started at Vermont College of Fine Art in 2016 in their low residency program. And I finished that in 2018. And along the way, um, I finished the manuscript of my first book and uh, got an agent, lost an agent, got another agent, started a second book. And then um, I guess it was 2018, my agent sold this book. And by then I'd finished the second manuscript, which is a standalone sequel. And my agent called the publisher and said, uh, that's great, you, you want to buy Liza's novel. She has another one too. And they said, send it over. And three days later, I got a two book deal. So lucky me. Um, so that's really how it happened. Um, I just, you know, I'm a big believer in, as we move through life, through the different stages of life, that um, 
as time permits and as, as our working lives permit, that we reinvent our, that we, we find something creative that inspires us. And sometimes we have to reinvent ourselves, you know, depending on our circumstances and, and adapt to whatever is going on in our lives. So for me, that turned into writing and I've, it inspires me and it challenges me. And some days it makes me want to crawl under the bed and cry, um, which is kind of what's going on right now because I'm working on the pre-publication edits for my second novel. And that's when, that's when the editor tells you this, I don't believe this. I saw this coming from the very beginning. Um, this character is ridiculous and, you know, things like that, um, that are, <laughs> that are kind of hard to hear, but necessary because once you get through them all, hopefully you're going to have a much better manuscript. So the second book comes out next August, um, set in the Great Depression, some of the same characters in Etiquette for Runaways. And, um, and yeah, so that's what I'm working on here. Here's the book again. Well, congratulations on a fascinating life. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and for sharing it with us so generously today. Really appreciate that. Oh, Carolyn, I can't thank you enough for having me um, to, to talk to you all. What, what a nice group of people. And it's so great that you all do things like this for the community. Um, and thank you also, you know, for Sibley and Writer House, because Sibley's the one who contacted me and said, hey, you know, maybe we could make something work here and, uh, and get this to happen. So thank you, Sibley, very much. Yeah, and definitely, and we're recording this, so um, it'll be available on our website, and um, that would be the Center at Belvedere YouTube. You just Google the Center at Belvedere YouTube, probably in, a, well, in a week or so. So, you know, I know you're going to have friends who missed it, and you're going to say, you've got to hear Liza's talk, so you'll be able to, to go there, and we have other talks up there, too. Okay, and I just put my website address, again, into the, um, into the chat Anyway, LizaNashTaylor.com. Uh, love it if you'd follow me on Instagram. I post a lot about fashion on Instagram, um, more antique fashion things um, and style, and especially the 1920s ha things having to do with my novel and my research. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me, everybody. Yeah. And I loved it. And, um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.